Linux is widely known. Its direct ancestor, Minix, is now over 30 years old. The story of how it and Linux got started is not well known. There are lessons to be learned from the development of Minix. Join us as we speak to Professor Andy Tenenbaum. After AT&T's lawyers had forbidden the teaching of Unix in uh, classrooms, I decided to write my own version of Unix v7 so students could learn all about it and study the operating system code. The IBM PC had just come out, and so I thought I'd write it for the PC because it was a cheap uh, machine that even students could afford. It was about $1,500. Working evenings and weekends, I managed to get it mostly working in about two years. The initial development was done on my uh, PC at home using Mark Williams Coherent. I had to use Coherent because I didn't have a C compiler. Later, one of my programmers ported a C compiler we'd written for one of our academic research projects to Minix, and then I could use Minix for its own development. As a result, I was very sensitive to any bugs or flaws in the system. There's been enormous progress in computer hardware since I started. When I, when I got to MIT, they were in the process of upgrading their IBM 709 to a newer computer. I recently compared the 709 to a modern iPad. An iPad is 70,000 times faster, got 7,300 times as much RAM, 1,000 times more external storage, and it's one ten thousandth of the price. You know, I compared this to how aircraft have developed over the same period. At that time, the Boeing 707 was the top aircraft. If aircraft had developed the same way computers have in the same time period, you could fly from London to San Francisco in 12 seconds, the plane could hold two million people, it could fly around the earth 300 times nonstop, and a ticket would cost 16 cents. One of the early adopters of Minix was Linus Torvalds, who studied it very carefully and then developed Linux uh, using uh, Minix as a, a base system. If he hadn't had that, he probably wouldn't have developed Linux, and then there wouldn't have been an Android, because Android is based upon Linux. If there hadn't been an Android, then I think that the relative stock prices of Samsung and Apple might be quite different now. Debugging Minix on the bare metal was well nigh impossible, and I couldn't get it working. As a last ditch effort, I wrote a simulator, and it worked perfectly on the simulator, and I couldn't figure this out. I mentioned this to one of my students, and he said, you know, the 8088 gives interrupt 15 when it gets too hot. And I said, where'd you hear that? And he said, I heard it somewhere. And I said, it's not on the documentation, but he insisted he heard it somewhere. So I put in code to catch interrupt 15. Why microkernels? My interest is in simple, reliable software. When you divide software into pieces, you got smaller chunks, and it's easier to understand what they do, so it's less likely there'll be bugs in it. For an operating system, having only a small piece which runs on the bare metal, and the rest of the operating system run as a bunch of separate processes in user mode, each protected by the hardware, gives you a more reliable system because problems in one part can't spread to another part. I'm not really sure how many people are using Minix um, for various purposes because our license doesn't require them to dis disclose that. But I do know that the CD-ROM image has been downloaded more than 700,000 times in the last 10 years, and we're getting 20 to 30,000 hits a month on the website. So there's apparently a certain amount of interest in it. The focus for the future is building a simple, reliable, fault-tolerant, self-healing system that could be used in embedded systems. For example, space flight, hospital systems, nuclear reactors, banking systems that have to be online 24-7, and other things very high reliability is important. Find out more in the contributed article, Lessons Learned from 30 Years of Minix, in the March 2016 issue of Communications of the ACM.